Hey you guys, I know you guys have been asking me forever and a day to do a Draw My Life and I am ready. Um, for a while, I debated on if I wanted to go there because I saw a lot of Draw My Life videos and everybody's videos were really positive and touching and I didn't know if I was worthy of sharing my story. And I, I needed to be comfortable and honest enough to share my story, so I'm ready to do that. So let's go ahead and get started. This is my life, check it out, check it out. So you guys know me as Lovely T. 2002. I also have a channel that's 2013. But the reason why I go by 2002 is because this was the year that I bought my first computer and that I first logged onto the internet. So my real name is Tammy Tope. A lot of people don't know that. So this is where I get the lovely T from. I get the T-I because there's a T and an I in my name. I am of Nigerian descent. My parents are both from Nigeria. And my parents were married in Nigeria. I had um, my mom, my dad, and then came me. And I was just a little bundle of joy. I was so cute. And my mom tells me that what happened is that at six months old, I was laying in my crib. And um, all of a sudden, I just blew up like a watermelon. I got really, really big. My face got really fat. I was and sad. I just couldn't stop crying. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And she noticed that my joints were really swollen. My arms were swollen. My legs were swollen. And nothing they did made me stop crying. I was just miserable. So mom decided to pack me up and take me to the doctor. So she got everything together, she bundled me up in her arms, and she took me to the doctor. And she was really, really, you know, sad, and she was really, really worried because she didn't know what was wrong with her baby. And so when she got to the hospital, um, the doctor was like, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but your child is sick. You have another sick child. And my mom was like, what do you mean? And at that point, they found out that I had sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease is a blood disorder that means that, that my red blood cells, they come out normal, but I go into crises whenever I get stressed. And forgive me for my drawing. Um, I also suffer from arthritis in my hands, so it's hard for me to draw and write at times. That's why I do everything on the keyboard. But if I get too stressed or if I get too cold, my cells go from this to this. They turn into all types of crazy shapes and they get stuck in my blood veins and it causes tremendous pain and it hurts so bad. Like this. I've been through a lot in life and um, I refuse to let my illness slow me down. I refuse to let my illness define me. I feel like God put me here for a purpose. My life has been a bunch of hard knocks. I didn't have life easy. So let me go ahead and just kind of break some things down to you. So in my family, we have mom, dad, and then there are my two younger brothers, Femi. And he's like 6'5", so he's like super tall. And we have Olumide. He's really tall too. He's 6'3". Um, we call him Steve though. And then I have my little sister, Olubukola, but we call her Buki. And she's like 5'7". We're all pretty tall. I'm 5'7 myself. So we're all pretty tall. But my brothers are really tall. I wish I had their height. I wish I was like 5'11". But I'm 5'7". So it was us. But before there was us, I had another brother. And a lot of people don't know about him. And this is how I first found out about my little brother. When I was six years old, I had a major crisis. Um, I was at school, I was in first grade, and I started crying. I didn't feel good. And at that point in time, I had no idea that I had a disease. And so my teacher, Ms. Sajak, was like, you know what, you need to go down to the nurse's office. And she walked me down there because I was in a lot of pain and I was limping. I was limping through the hallway. And so they called my parents, they, my parents came and got me, and I ended up being hospitalized in the hospital for two months straight. So I was in the hospital, and that's when I found out at the age of six that I had sickle cell disease. So I was in the hospital, I was sad, I was hooked up to all types of IVs, um, 
getting blood transfusions. And I will never forget, I had a roommate in the hospital. And I don't really remember her name because this was like, I don't know, 20 years ago. But she was so sweet and she had cancer. So she was sick, she wasn't in school, but we were best friends. We would stay up all night and just talk and talk and run our miles and the nurses, we would, you know, they had a field day with us because we were always cracking jokes and we used to watch Thundercats all the time, me and her. We'd be watching TV, we were into the same TV shows. So we'd watch Thundercats, um, My Little Pony, we would watch um, Jim and the Misfits, and at that time, my English wasn't that good. You know, I was still in ESL, but I learned a lot of English in those few months because of my roommate and because of watching TV. So I was able to learn English a lot easier in the hospital. It was just, it was funny. And my parents came to see me every day and um, they were worried and my little brothers would come and see me as well. But what made it really special is that one day while I was in the hospital, um, the nurse, came in and she says we have a, a surprise for you and so I sit up in bed and literally my entire first grade class these are all the kids it was a bunch of them like literally 20 kids are in my hospital room and they came bearing gifts <laughs> and my teacher was there Miss Sajak so Miss Sajak was there the kids had bought me my very first My Little Pony doll and I'll never forget, she had rainbow colored hair, she had a rainbow colored mane, and she was the My Little Pony doll with the jeweled eyes. So she had the jeweled eyes, and that was a present for my teacher in my entire first grade class. So shout out to all the students at Erickson who came to see me when I was in the hospital, because I almost died. It was that serious, I almost passed away at the age of six. And um, my class came and they made me feel, feel very special. And I remember um, my roommate, she was there and they made her feel very special too. And she was happy that my class was there and all the kids were just, you know, talking to us and asking us questions. And it meant the world to me. And to this day, even though it's been 20 something years, I still think about all those kids and I still remember a lot of those faces. So thank you guys for coming to visit me when I was at my worst point. So after two months of rehabilitation, I was able to walk out the hospital because it took me about a month to learn to rewalk again and use my joints and, and everything else. So I was able to walk out the hospital. That's my little dress here. Let me finish making my dress so I don't look like I have some balls. So I was able to walk out the hospital and I will never forget my roommate was still there and we cried. I remember she was in tears because we had spent two months together and she was still sick and we didn't know when she was getting out and we exchanged phone numbers and we talked but you know as, as time goes on you lose contact and till this day I don't know if she lived or she passed away but I remember she had cancer and she was a really strong girl and I remember what she looks like to this day and um, I will forever be grateful for the company that I had with me in the hospital. She helped to make me stronger and I helped to make her stronger as well and we will forever be bonded because we were children who were told that we wouldn't make it and like I said I don't know what her faith was to this day whatever happened to her but I miss her a lot and I'm grateful that she was there to share that moment and that time and space with me. So while I was at home recuperating because I still couldn't go back to school so I was at home with my mom, being nosy, you know, little first grader, little six-year-old self. And I was in my mom's bedroom and I started rummaging through an old photo album. And I found an old photo album. And um, as I'm flipping through the pages of the photo album, I see a crib. So it's like a little bed actually, it's a bed. And there's a baby on the bed. And the baby's on the bed. And it looks to be a little girl, but I'm not too sure. And the baby's just beautiful. She's smiling and she's happy. And at the edge of the bed, there's a little boy. And the little boy looks to be about four or five years old. And he's on the edge of the bed. And he's just, you know, he's staring at this little girl and he's smiling. He's just cheesing. He has the biggest smile. And they're looking at each other. The baby's looking at him and he's looking at the baby. And you can just feel this connection that they have together. They're just staring at each other. So I asked my mom, I'm like, mom, who is this? Who, who, who is this baby? You know, who, who is this kid? Who is this? 
I had so many questions. And my mom says, that's your older brother, Dari. And I was like, Dari, older brother? What do you mean I have an older brother? Because all I knew at that point was my two little brothers. We never knew we had an older brother. And my mom told me that Dari was sick. And this was the very last picture of me and him together. He died shortly after we took this picture. Um, like myself, Dare also had sickle cell disease. And he ended up dying at age five. So that's why my parents were really upset when I blew up like a watermelon at six months. And they found out that I too had sickle cell disease and they prepared to bury another child like they had five years before then. So the only thing I have of Dow right now because my dad has the picture, I just have memories and I'll never forget that picture. I'll never forget finding it. I'll never forget knowing about him. And I remember after finding out that he had died, I remember I just cried, I cried like a baby. And um, I told him I would never forget him and one day I would share his story. And I love him, you know, even though I never got to really speak to him and hang out with him, I love him. And he's been there for me and he's guided me through life. And he's been the one to tell me to go left as opposed to going right. And he saved me from a lot of situations. And Dare is my guardian angel. He is my angel. He is my big brother. And because of him, he's been there for me and he's helped me travel this sickle cell <laughs> journey of life. So I thank him for that. I miss him and um, I love him. That's my big brother, even though he's not here in the physical. So soon after finding out about my, so soon after finding out about my big brother, um, I went back to first grade and um, the kids welcomed me with open arms. The kids were really nice to me in first grade. You know, kids are nice. It's not until you get older that kids just become fucking evil. But they were nice and they were all happy and it was lots of hugs and, you know, everyone was so happy and all my teachers were there and all day people kept hugging me and people were really happy because I didn't die and I was still here. And um, that made me happy and I love school. But my home life was very difficult. I had a very difficult childhood. A lot of angst, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. I went through a lot as a kid. Anything that you shouldn't say to a child, my father said to me. So because of that, we have a very strained relationship to this day. I was sad we, and I watched a lot of TV. <laughs> and I live vicariously through the TV. I enjoy watching shows like The Fresh Prince and um, Martin. <laughs> and all those shows helped to shape my, my life. And we weren't rich like the other Nigerian families. We didn't have a lot of money. We had debt due to my hospitalizations. Being in the hospital um, caused us to go into debt because I didn't have health insurance. So a lot of times when I was sick, Unless it was serious, unless I couldn't breathe or I was near death, I didn't go to the hospital. Um, I stayed home and I toughed it out and I just took Advil and drunk a lot of water and missed days of school. But we couldn't afford any more hospital stays because of the debt. And so I went to high school in the hood. <laughs> um, high school was a different ballgame. Whereas in junior high, I was able to fit in with a lot of people. Um, my high school was very different. It was a fashion show. Um, that was the first time I ever saw kids rocking like polo and Tommy Hilfiger and you know all the latest shit. And we just didn't have the money for that. You know, it was four of us. My parents worked hard, but we just didn't have the money for that. I had one really good friend, and she was African too. And her name was Helen. And we were really cool. She was from East Africa. She was Eritrean. And we met in ninth grade and um, we maintained our friendship for a long time. And um, I was, you know, West African and she was East African. And we got along on the strength of that because we really didn't fit in with the African-American kids because they didn't consider us black. 
you know, um, I had a lot of African American friends, but the more popular hood ones, they just really didn't fool with us like that. And we were cool with that. That that was fine. Um, and then in the ninth grade, I got sick again and ended back up in the hospital. And I was in the hospital for two months. And I didn't have Helen's phone number at that time. So a lot of people, I didn't have a lot of friends in the ninth grade at school. Um, the kids at the rec center used to come see me in the hospital. Um, and then I had a neighborhood friend. Uh, her name was T. She was African-American and she was cool. She was my neighbor. Um, and then I remember that summer I had met another really good friend of mine. She was African-American and her name was Katie. And we were really, really close. We were close. And, and I had her phone number. So when she found out I was in the hospital, she had her boyfriend drive her to the hospital. And her, her boyfriend, and our other friend, Amanda, um, they all came to the hospital to come and see me. So they came to see me, and her cousins came. And it was quite a few people who used to come and come see me in the hospital while I was there for those two months. And a lot of friends from church and my cousins came. And... You know, I went through a lot, and um, once again, I, I almost died at age 16, but by the grace of God, I was able to make it out. And then when I got out the hospital and I came back to school, a lot of kids were shocked to see me. Um, they're like, oh, I thought you died. You know, kids are just, you know, kids are just fucking assholes. So like, oh, you know, you're back. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm back. I didn't die. You know, so it was just, it was crazy, but um you know, people were cool and some people didn't care that I was back and, you know, kind of just sank back into the wall. But I had Helen and we were cool and we were friends. And um, I remember that year I was in my room and I was watching MTV. Because up until that point, I didn't know anybody with sickle cell. Nobody in my family even has it. Like how I looked up and got this, I don't know. Besides my baby brother who died, I didn't know anybody else. So I'm watching MTV and Tabitha Thorn, Tabitha Thorn comes on and um, they're like breaking news. Uh, t Boz of TLC has come out to speak about her illness. So I'm like, huh? Her illness? And um, it came out that year that t Boz also had sickle cell disease. And I remember just feeling an overwhelming sense of happiness because I felt like I'm not alone. And... I was just so happy to know that somebody else knew my pain, knew my anxiety, knew my hurt. Even if she was famous, there was somebody else who could walk in my shoes. And um, seeing that broadcast live meant the world to me. And t Boss has always been a hero of mine. And I remember being scared like if t Boss ever dies, I know my days are numbered. And to this day, t Boz is still alive and she's 42 years old, I believe, and she's here. And I look up to t Boz so much. And I remember back when I had tweeted her, um, when I first got on Twitter and she responded back to me and that made my life. I was so happy because she's always been a childhood hero of mine, actually a shero of mine, a childhood shero. So when I saw that, that made me feel better about my condition. So, I will say this is about June, maybe sophomore year in high school. I'm feeling better, not, you know, in and out the hospital, doing good. And me and my friends decide to go downtown Minneapolis to go kick it. So it's me and my homegirls, we're all dressed up. Now I'm dressing more girly. I'm feeling better. I'm getting into modeling and fashion. And I'm able to put clothes together that look good. And, you know, just different things. And we would borrow each other's clothes, me and T. And T was a hairstylist. Like, she kept my hair up. That girl helped me through high school because I did not know how to do my hair. So she would always do my hair. We'd get dressed up, go downtown Minneapolis, and meet up with our other friends and hang over south. And we had a lot of family in Minneapolis. So we didn't really hang in St. Paul too much. We were always across the river in Minneapolis because she was from the north side, and I grew up on the south side. So we were always on that side of town. So we didn't meet another friend. It wasn't T. It was another friend, actually. And I see this really cute guy, and he tries to talk to me. And I'm like, damn, he's fine. You know, he has these pretty hazel eyes and, you know, a really cute smile. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, he thinks I'm cute. And, you know, and I thought he was cute and everything else. And um, this 
young man. <laughs> Ended up being my future husband and the father of my children. And we've been through a lot of shit. And that's when I met him. I met him in the summer of 97. I was 16 years old when I met him. And um, he was like my first official love. And um, we just knew we'd be together forever. And I, you know, I just, I really cared about him. He really cared about me. He understood my condition after, you know, I finally, you know, told him and stuff like that. He, he understood it. Um, and we started dating shortly after. So we started kicking it in like the 10th grade. That was like my boyfriend, and he lived in North Minneapolis. He used to wear braids and stuff. So he lived on the north side, and I lived in St. Paul. So it was always a struggle to kind of see each other because we lived on, you know, different parts of the city. But we always managed to be able to see each other. I had been told from the time I was a kid that I couldn't have kids, so no kids, and that I would be dead by the time I'm 20 years old. So I was like, huh, oh, I'm 16. I'll probably be dead in another few years. Uh, you know, YOLO. <laughs> so we're just, you know, basically doing us and, and everything else. And we've been together for a while. And um, we have been together two years off and on. You know, we went through our makeups and breakups and things that, you know, young people go through. And when I was 18, I got pregnant. That's my belly. I got pregnant and um, I was scared. I had just graduated high school, thank God. But I was terrified because I was sick. Um, I was always told I couldn't have kids. I just knew I was gonna die. I didn't know anybody else with sickle cell. I didn't know anybody else who had a baby with sickle cell. But what was so ironic is a few months later, t <laughs> also was pregnant. She was also pregnant and that made me feel good. So t um, her daughter was born in October and my son was born in January. So I kept up with everything with T-Boz and her pregnancy. But um, I was scared and my family was upset. My mom was mad and they kicked me out the house. So I was kicked out and I had to go stay in Minneapolis and I lived with my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law and her kids. And it was a lot of us in this house over north. So I went to go stay with his mom and I finished out the rest of my pregnancy there because my mom wasn't talking to me My dad felt some type of way and it was just a mess. But on Martin Luther King's birthday on January 15th I had my son 2001 and um, That was the greatest day of my life. I had my son and It was crazy I had this little bundle of joy. I had this life that I had to take care of. And um, it was like the, the best day because I never thought I would be able to have kids. Now I had a purpose. Now I had something to live for. And um, I told myself and I told God that, you know, if I was to make it through this pregnancy, I would raise him to the best of my ability and do what I had to do. And that's what I've been trying to do my whole life ever since I had him. And my son is now 13. Um years old and I also have another son so I went from having no kids being told I would never have kids to being a mother of two so I have two kids my youngest child is eight me and their father we ended up getting divorced we got divorced three years ago basically just grew apart I started coming into my own I discovered YouTube and I loved it. I loved it. I love the fact that I could teach people things about hair and, um, you know, just doing commentary and, and skincare. And it was like this whole new world because up until then, I just worked. You know, I worked in corporate America and um, I try to maintain my health and, you know, raise my kids and be a wife. And I loved it. I loved YouTube. It, it gave me an opportunity to network. It gave me an opportunity to network and connect with people from all over the world. YouTube was such a blessing, but with that, my husband was not supportive. He became jealous, jelly. <laughs> um, he felt some type of way. 
he, he just did he just wasn't supportive and um there was a lot of stuff that was going on in our marriage that was stressing me out and i was going into the hospital literally once a month in and out the hospital in and out in and out in and out almost dying and um it just became too much and on top of that he was cheating and um he became not only verbally abusive but physically at that point in time um he was drinking heavily he wasn't he wasn't the same person that I fell in love with um he changed he was drinking a lot he wasn't being responsible he wasn't helping out with the kids everything was on me and his mom um you know I thank God I had my mother-in-law with me because she's been a, a huge source of strength and, and we're very close. She's she is my other mother, you know. We're very close. I talk to her all the time and she helps me out with the boys all the time. But after a while she told me that, you know what, you need to let it go. It doesn't make any sense to hold on to something that's slipping away. I didn't want my little boys thinking that that's how you're supposed to treat a female. And I didn't want them thinking that that's how relationships um, are supposed to work. So I packed up my kids, packed up my mother-in-law, because <laughs> she's my best friend. She's known me since I was 16. Um, and we moved back to Minnesota. We left North Carolina. We moved back to Minnesota. And um, I moved back in with my mother. And my mom helped me to get back on my feet. And at that point in time, I was also laid off of my job. So I was depressed again because I was, you know, divorced, out of work, and living with my mother. And I hadn't lived with my mom since I was 18. So, so to go from being on my own and running my own household. Um, to go from that to living with mom was hard. It was very hard and I became even more depressed. And I started, um, you know, self-medicating. I would pop Vicodin all the time because I was in a lot of pain. I was trying to numb my physical pain and my mental pain. I was in pain from my divorce. I was hurt because I put a lot into my marriage. Um, I was in pain from the, you know, the, the results of my sickle cell. I'm um, going through that. I was just going through a lot. So I would pop pills all the time. Pop pills, pop pills, 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 and the doctors would just give me pills, pills, pills. And um, it got to a point where I just wanted to once again kill myself. And um, my last suicide attempt was in 2009. I was very, I tried to overdose again because I was in, I was just in a lot of pain. So I tried it again. And um, I was rushed to the hospital and I stayed for a month. While I was in the hospital, um, I got a lot of care. I got a lot of care, I got counseling, I had a lot of love, a lot of my friends um, came to see me. Um, everybody was in the hospital, my mom was there all the time, my brothers, their girlfriends, it's like everybody was there, my homeboy Dontrell, um, Tasha, David, it was just so many people that came to see me. Um, my cousin Tola, it was a lot of us. And um, they helped encourage me and they let me know that, you know, I was loved and that I had a whole community of people who cared about me, not just on the internet, um, but also in the real world. And at that moment, I knew that I had to be here, not only for my little boys, but for all these people who loved me because they let me know that if I wasn't here, they would be sad. And um, at that point in time, I knew I had to get my suicidal thoughts and my depression um, under control. I had to get it under control. Um, I'm on a cancer.
cancer treatment program and this cancer treatment program I've been on it for three years now and it's been a blessing I haven't been in the hospital with a crisis in I would say going on two years I've been hospital free I take four pills a day and um, it maintains my blood and it's helped me a lot I'm not as sick as I used to be I still get sick but I'm able to treat my illness at home rather than in the hospital hey you guys it's your girl Tina I hope you guys enjoyed my draw my life um, it meant a lot to me that you guys are requesting so often to do this. Um, I didn't know how much information I wanted to put in there, but finally I just thought, you know what, let me just be all the way open and honest. And of course I can't tell my entire story in, you know, 30 minutes, but those are the most important things that shape me to become the person I am today. And I wanted to be up close and I wanted to be candid and open and honest about my illness, about a lot of things that I've been through, because I want to be an inspiration to other people out there, young men and women who are going through things right now who think that it's not going to get better when it truly does get better I also want to you know be able to help those who are out there with not only sickle cell but you know other illnesses like diabetes or HIV you know people who are really going through things and they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel or they don't think that they'll ever you know be able to go to school or have children and what I would like people who do have a chronic illness or who are sick or, you know, going through, you know, chemotherapy or, you know, kidney transplant, radiation, just whatever your issue may be, just remember to never allow a doctor or a diagnosis to dictate your destiny. At the end of the day, we all have a path to walk down. We're all going through this crazy thing called life. We're all trying to figure out our journey, our purpose. So you got to stay positive. You got to keep those around you who mean the most to you and who mean you well. The bottom of my heart, I want to thank everyone who has helped to make both of my channels what they are today, who have supported me, shared my videos, thumbs up, posted them on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, to those who reach out to me all the time just to ask how I'm doing health-wise. If they don't see me online, they call, they, you know, send a tweet, they check on me. It means the world to me. And I'm also happy that I've not only been able to make a lot of friends on the internet, but some of those friends that I made online have also become like family. And, you know, I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for your support, for your well wishes, and continue to support my channel. Continue to be there for me as I will be here for you guys. So thank you guys again for encouraging me to share my story and to draw my life. So I'll talk to y'all later. Deuces.